OK. So last time, we went over some different applications for convex hulls. And we saw that we could use them to do a whole bunch of crazy different things with uh, the geometry of spheres. And we could also use it to speed up uh, linear programming queries. Uh, and this turns out to be really great for doing things like, for example, uh, if you have like a bunch of points on a sphere, you want to find all points contained in a disk. Or if you maybe want to like say, OK, you got a bunch of points, find the closest point on a sphere to some given query point in a geodesic sense. So we could you know, answer these queries uh, very efficiently. Um, but sometimes you don't have points that happen to be distributed over a sphere. Instead, you get points on a plane. And so what we're going to talk about today is a variation, in a sense, on the idea of a convex hull, which allows you to do operations in the plane as efficiently. So we're going to think of this as kind of like the flat version of a convex hull. And this concept will be covered or uh, wrapped up into some sort of higher level idea that we're going to call a Delaunoy triangulation. But before I can define precisely what that is, I actually need to tell you what a triangulation is. So the starting point is this idea of a triangulation. Right. So this uh, shouldn't be confused with simplicial complexes, though it is a simplicial complex. But it's not just any simplicial complex. It's one that has some particular uh, nice properties. right? Uh, and by the way, let me say one additional thing, too, is that for this class, I'm going to be focusing primarily on 2D planar geometry. Because while these results do generalize to higher dimensions, they turn out to be not terribly useful uh, you know, for reasons due primarily to things like upper bound type arguments. right? So you end up with data structures that are just so enormous, you wouldn't even want to bother with building it. right? So this is all going to be 2D uh, for today, right? Uh, though you can kind of you know, fill in the blanks in your own kind of like notebook or figure out how it would generalize on your own. It doesn't really change that much, right? <clears throat> but the story today is 2D planar geometry. Um, OK, so a triangulation, and again, we're going to say in the plane. Uh, so we'll work in R2 uh, of a set of points. P in R2 is a simplicial complex. So note that it's simplicial here. It's not just a cell complex with polyhedral faces. right? Uh, so it's a simplicial complex delta where between any distinct pi, pj, and p. So we take any pair of points um, in p. The edge, or the, uh, the line segment, uh, pi, pj, crosses some edge of the one skeleton of this thing, right? So we'll just think of it in the following sense, right? Which is that if we take any pair of points, uh, then the edge is going to intersect another edge, is another way to think about this. So uh, what this means is that it's uh, every point is connected to every other point in some way in this triangulation. So uh, we can take, I'll just draw a picture of a triangulation here. Right. So so at this point, this is not a triangulation because I can draw an edge between those two points, and it's not going to cross some other edge. So I have to keep sticking more triangles in this thing until eventually they're all connected. And then at this point, I have a triangulation. So I can take any pair of points, like say these two, if I draw a line between them uh, like this, you can see that it crosses a bunch of edges. And if I have two points which are adjacent to each other, then it's going to intersect the edge over there. So 
That's the idea, right? So at this point, all of the points are all connected together using triangles. Uh, if I take any pair of points and draw a line between them, it's going to cross an edge of some other point inside the triangulation. So triangulations uh, happen to be pretty closely related to convex hulls. In fact, here's a very simple algorithm that we could use to construct a triangulation, not necessarily like you know, some optimal or super triangulation, but just a very simple algorithm for, say, given a collection of points, connect them together with triangles. So here's the, uh, the easy triangulation algorithm. And we can do this in n log n time. So uh, n log n triangulation. Again, in 2D. We're not going to focus on the other stuff, but you can see pretty easily how this is going to generalize. So here's the way we do this, is we start with some set of points as an input. And the first step is we sort them along x, right, or whatever. Uh, second step, we run convex hull incrementally. So what we'll do is we'll start with the first point. All right, we're done. We get the next point along the x-axis. Maybe I'll put it over here so it's more clear where it is. And then we basically insert this into the convex hull here, so we'd end up with a kind of trivial triangulation. We get the next point, insert it. Next point here, insert it into the hull. Next point, insert it into the hull. Next point here, insert it into the hull. And the way we do this is that as we insert the points into the hull, we compute those bitangent lines, right? So say I take this point, I compute the bitangent here, the bitangent here. And then for all of the visible faces, we just triangulate them. So we connect them here with triangles, and then we get here. And then when we're all done, we got a triangulation of this entire point set. Right? So we basically compute tangent lines, three triangulate visible faces. And then these two steps would actually be for each point. So it's sort of a simple idea, right? I mean, you're just going to march along them along some particular axis, take a point, insert it into the hull, take the next point, insert it into the hull. You can think of uh, this as basically doing exactly the same thing that the incremental convex hull algorithm does, except in instead of throwing away these faces once we hit a visible face, we're going to replace them with triangles. That's all, right? So a really trivial algorithm. And it actually shows us another interesting property about triangulations, which is that if we look at the boundary of this whole thing when we're all done, it's actually the convex hull of the point set. Right? So here is a property of any triangulation. Right? So uh, we'll say that the boundary of any triangulation delta is equal to the convex hull of the point set. So uh, this is a sort of theorem, right? Where again, we're using you know, delta to be the triangulation of P, right? <clears throat> OK, so that's the basic idea for a triangulation. Uh, so far, so simple. Um, we can say a little bit about the topology of a triangulation here. Uh, so remember before we calculated the Euler characteristic of a sphere, right? And we saw that in for even dimensional spheres, the Euler characteristic was 2. For odd dimensions, it was 0. Right? So uh, we also know that the Euler characteristic is a homotopy invariant. Right? And if you remember what that means, it's that we can take any shape and we can deform it into another shape. Right? And as long as we don't like, cut it or tear it or whatever, right, the Euler characteristic will be the same. Uh, and similarly, we also know that it's counted by doing this alternating sum of the cells in the complex. So we count the number of vertices uh, minus the number of edges plus the number of triangles and so on. So um, as a sort of geometric proof, right, or just kind of like a, a sketch of how this works, imagine I take a one sphere here, or it could even be some higher dimensional sphere, and I cut out one of the faces like that, and then I flatten it into an interval. Right? Well, the Euler characteristic of this whole thing, right? this is just the Euler characteristic of the sphere by itself, right? minus the Euler characteristic of that one face. Right? Well, we know this thing here is going to be 
0 if it's an odd dimension, right? so 1D here, or 2 if it's even, right? because this is just the Euler characteristic of a sphere. right? And this is going to be uh, negative 1 in an odd dimension, or uh, plus 1 in an even dimension, because it's an alternating sum. right? So we know that the Euler characteristic of a triangulation right, in any dimensional space, I'm saying this here, right? This is going to be the same as the Euler characteristic of a sphere uh, plus negative 1 to the d, right? Because we killed a d-dimensional cell inside this thing. And if we look at the two cases, right, we're going to basically have 0 minus 1, right? Which will give us a negative, or which, no, 0 plus 1, right, for the even d case. And then, uh, what's the right way to? Yeah, negative 1 to the d plus 1, actually. Yeah, because remember, we have to go kill the d minus 1 dimensional cell. But right, that's fine. So in the case of 0, uh, we're going to get 1. right? For 1, we'll get 1. For 2, we'll get 1, and so on. So this basically tells us that the Euler characteristic of any triangulation is just 1. right? So. Uh, let me erase this stuff here. But hopefully you followed that. I don't think it's a terribly complicated idea there. But that's the Euler characteristic for a triangulation. It's just one less than the uh, Euler characteristic of uh, a two-sphere, right? because we just pop a triangle off of like the top and flatten it out onto the plane. The resulting triangulation is just going to be one less than the Euler characteristic of the thing that we started with. Um, the other thing that this tells us is for planar triangulations, um, the number of triangles in it is basically order n, right? Because we're still going to have these like boundary triangles or whatever that maybe came from some weirder cell. But uh, at most, that's going to kill some constant number of them. So the upper bound is order n. So the number of triangles here is going to be in order of the number of points, right? Which we'll just write as cardinality of p. So these are facts about triangulations in general. Now, there's a lot of different possible triangulations. I won't go through the details and prove it, but you can convince yourself pretty quickly that there's actually like an exponential number of different ways that you can triangulate a given point set by you know, constructing an example. But of all of these triangulations, there might be some that we like a little better than others. Maybe they're more optimal in some sense, or maybe better suited for certain specific applications. I mean, especially if we think about problems like range searching or sort of like expanding out you know, along some sphere or searching in a geodesic sense, we would like these points to be connected to points which are closer to them. Right? This is, I mean, I didn't get too much into the details of it last time, right? but the reason that these algorithms for, say, half space, or for finding like a circular disk right, on a sphere, right? The reason that works is that all of these points are relatively well connected to their neighbors. And so when we do this search, expanding out, we're going to look at the points which are closer by. So we'd like to construct a triangulation where all of the points are closest to the points that they're nearest to each other. This is a very hazy and intuitive kind of explanation. A more precise way of saying it is that we would like to minimize the, we would like to make the smallest angle of any triangle inside this triangulation as large as possible. Right? So this is now getting to this next idea. Right? So I'm going to erase all of this. I'll keep the word triangulation there, because that's what we're talking about. So here's this idea. Right? So this concept of making the smallest angle as large as possible turns out to have a number of applications in physics or uh, mechanical engineering. So for example, if you're using the triangulation as some sort of mesh that you're going to try to solve some you know, boundary value problem on, um, it turns out that, uh, for example, in the case of structural mechanics, the stiffness matrix that you have to invert, the condition number of that stiffness matrix can be related to the smallest angle inside your triangulation. So if you have like a very, very thin triangle with a very, very narrow angle, then the stiffness number will get very large. And then your system is going to be really expensive when you try to solve it iteratively. Or it might become numerically ill-conditioned, and then your solver could blow up or something could go wrong. So here's kind of the picture. 
So we're going to say that triangles, which are very long and very, very thin, are kind of bad, right? So these are going to be bad triangles, right? And these triangles, which are as close to you know, basically equilateral as possible, are going to be good, right? This is a value statement, but it's somewhat motivated by physical considerations. And it will turn out to have some other nice properties when we try to do this, right? But this is kind of the geometric justification that people use for trying to optimize triangulations, is that we want to make them look more like this, less like this. So how do we measure the goodness of a triangulation? So one way to do this is uh, we can just take all of the angles in the entire triangulation and then just sort them in a giant vector, right? And then we can compare two triangulations by just looking at these vectors of angles lexicographically. And so if one triangulation has a bigger angle vector than another triangulation, then we'd say that the smallest angle and all of like the k smallest angles in this triangulation are going to be at least bigger than the ones than the other triangulation. And so we could say that maybe it's a better triangulation in a sense, right? It's closer to being a good triangulation. That's the intuitive idea. So let's try to make this precise. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to define this concept called an angle vector, right? I think I'm going to need more space here, so I'm going to erase this. So angle vector. OK, so given a triangulation, uh, delta of p, right? So p is the point set, delta is the triangulation. Um, let uh, alpha i j be the angles of triangle uh, t i in delta. So here's our picture here, is that this is triangle i, right? And we'll say that this angle here, we'll write this as alpha i1, this will be alpha i2, and this will be alpha i3, right? So this is triangle t i, right? So define uh, alpha 1. So this is now with like only one subscript instead of two. So we're going to write this as, say, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, etc., all the way up to alpha 3m, right? Where we'll suppose that where m is equal to the number of triangles in this whole thing to be the angles alpha i j sorted in increasing order. So this is going to have this property that if we take two entries out of this list, uh, then i is going to be less than or equal to alpha j, which implies that i is less than or equal to j. So we're basically just going to take all of the uh, entries inside this whole, we're going to just take all of the angles of all of the triangles, we're going to sort them in this giant vector here, right? And that's going to be the angle vector. So we're going to call this thing here, we'll write it as like big A of delta. And we'll say that this big A of delta, which is all of these angles, A1, alpha 2, alpha 3m is the angle vector of the triangulation. So I'll go draw a box here. OK, so that's the idea. So given two triangulations, we can compare their angle vectors by just uh, looking at the lexicographic order of the elements in the angle vector. So here's how we'll do this. 
uh, given to triangulations. Triangulations. Delta, delta prime. Say that a of delta is greater than a of delta prime, if and only if. Um, they're basically lexicographically uh, larger, right? So we'll basically say um, alpha. There exists some i greater than zero, or we'll write it as basically say zero less than i less than three m, such that uh, for all j less than i, uh, we'll write this as basically a of delta of i. It's a kind of a messy looking way to write a lexicographic order. Or this should be j, not i, right? And then the ith term is going to be greater, right? So this should be greater. Or the ith part. OK. It's kind of a messy way to write it, unfortunately, but it's just a lexicographic order. So either they're equal in the first term, or you know it's going to be um, like bigger, right? So this is a little bit confusing to think about, but let's try to maybe walk through it a couple of times, right? We've got this big vector of all the angles, and they're sorted so that the tiniest angles come first, and then when we're going to basically compare them, we're going to start looking at the smallest angles, and if they're equal, then we just keep going. Otherwise, we'll eventually get to some point where one of this guy's like tiniest possible angle so far is going to be bigger than the other triangulation's smallest possible angles. And then at which point, we'll say that this is a, a better triangulation, or its angle vector is bigger than the other triangulation. And so here's the idea. Right? So we'll say, define a triangulation delta to be angle optimal uh, if and only if for all other uh, triangulations uh, delta prime of p a of delta is greater than or equal to a of delta prime. That's the idea. So this is what we want to do, is we want to construct angle optimal triangulations. We want to find the triangulation that has the best possible angle vector of all of these triangulations, or it's the biggest angle vector. And this will mean that we've effectively made the smallest angle as large as we possibly can inside this. And so if we were to then feed it into some you know, physics uh, solver, uh, the stiffness matrix that it would build would, in a sense, be as a uh, high condition number as it possibly could, or basically be as well conditioned as possible. So that's the idea, right? We want to make this thing here very large, right? So how do we do that? OK. Uh, I need to make some space, so I'm going to erase this. Uh, any questions here so far? Yes. Yeah, well, yes, right? They will be, right? It turns out that you can think about uh, once you have a, a given point set, the boundary is basically fixed. So you can imagine that you basically have, um, I mean, so all triangulations for any uh, convex polytope are the same size, right? If you just throw a bunch of points on a sphere and you triangulate them, the Euler characteristic plus the fact that it's a triangulation uh, ensures that you're always going to have the same number of triangles. And you can solve for that exactly, right? So it'll always look the same. Now, in one sense, you can actually think of a triangulation of a point set as being a convex hull, right? Except where you just pop off these faces at the top, right? So you can imagine like you stick in like an extra point here at infinity, and then you triangulate all of the boundary faces, these ones on the convex hull of the point set. 
And then if you just remove those you know, finite number of faces, the resulting face set is always going to be uh, you know, a simplicial complex, and it's always going to have the same number of faces. right? So it's completely determined by the number of points on the boundary. right? So the Euler characteristic plus the number of points on the boundary completely determines the number of uh, triangles in the triangulation. Right? Uh, and at most, it can be order n. So, uh, OK. So that's. Are there characteristics that go on to the triangulation? Yes. Yeah, the Euler character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's basic. But remember, the Euler characteristic is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of triangles. Right? And so using that data, you know, uh, so that equation plus like the Den Somerville equation for uh, polytopes, right, allows you to completely determine the number of triangles, right? So you have the Euler characteristic equation, and then the fact that it's a simplicial complex means that every triangle uh, has exactly uh, three edges, right? And each edge is incident to uh, two triangles. So that, if you remember, so you have basically like a system of the following equations for polytopes, right? So you have this thing where you have basically V minus E plus F is equal to the Euler characteristic of the polytope, right? And then there's this additional equation, which is that um, 2e is equal to 3f, right, uh, for polytopes, right? Now, this is not true here, but the only place where it's not true is basically at the boundary. So if we imagine that we have like some triangulation, a bunch of stuff going on in here, you know, a ton of triangles, etc. The only place where this condition is violated is when we get to the boundary. And then we have these extra triangles which don't share a common edge. So for each boundary face, we have to subtract 1. So this equation becomes it's 2e. Um, this actually has to be modified to 2e minus k. And this k is the number of boundary faces. So this k is strictly uh, smaller than n, right? And so this will actually decrease the number of faces if we have more stuff on the boundary. But the net result is that it's still going to be at most order n, which is actually v in this equation. So hopefully that makes sense or answers your question. This is not a property of angle optimal triangulations, by the way. This is just a generic fact about triangulations. In a sense, actually, we will see, I'm probably getting a little bit too ahead of myself here. We'll see that constructing an angle optimal triangulation is really no harder than building any triangulation at all. In fact, really, the hard part is building the triangulation in the first place. It's sort of the, the terrible secret of all of this, right? If you have a triangulation, making it angle optimal is no big deal. The hard part is just bootstrapping this whole thing, right? So, but we, even that's actually not so bad, as we've already seen. So this is, turns out to be pretty easy stuff at the end of the day. But once we understand the math involved, right? OK, so we have this concept of an angle optimal triangulation. That's what we want to go to. Um, so here's one really simple strategy for angle optimizing a, tri for optimizing a triangulation. All right. So the idea is we're going to start with some arbitrary triangulation that we built however you want. All right. We'll just assume that it was a given. I mean, we've already seen that it's not so bad, really, to build a triangulation. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to try to improve it locally right, by um, applying like tiny modifications to this triangulation, and then hopefully improve the angle vector until eventually we get to some uh, steady state. Now, uh, what we would like to show is that the steady state will ultimately be the global steady state, and that's where we're going with it. But before that, let me describe how these local optimizations work. And this is the concept of a bistellar flip, right? Uh, so these are bistellar flips. So here's the idea. So imagine I have a triangle or a pair of triangles that look like this, right? So Say, like, my angles, like here, are very fat and wide, right? So I call these points A, B. Let's call this one A, B, C, D, right? What I could do if I have, like, a pair of triangles here, which are joined on some common edge, is I could just flip the edge so that instead of connecting A to B, it now connects C to D, right? And if I do that, applying this edge flip, 
then the new triangulation is going to look like this, right? All right? And so here's one really simple strategy that you could use to improve the angle vector of a triangulation. Is you just look through every edge in the triangulation, you look at the two opposite faces. Check that if you did a bistellar flip, the angle vector would improve. Then if you see such a thing, you can apply this bistellar flip locally, right? Just to that pair of triangles, and then you're done, right? So you just go through and you just flip all these edges and you just keep doing that until eventually uh, you're going to be stuck, right? Like there's no flips that you can do that will make the angle vector any better, right? So that's the idea, right? And here's the reason why that this is a local property. If you look here, we have basically like these angles here, 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 here. And then once we do this flip, we'll just check if any of these vectors improved. Right? So basically, if the smallest of all these vectors is larger than the smallest of all of these vectors, then this was a good bistellar flip to make. Right? Otherwise, it was like not a great idea. You shouldn't flip that edge. Right? So that's the idea. Right? So, okay. so everyone's clear on this concept of an edge flip. Right? I mean, I sort of like wrote it in a kind of geometric way. Right? And so here's the algorithm uh, for optimizing a triangulation, right? So simple algorithm. For angle vector improvement. There's one weird trick for angle vector improvement. All right. Um, so the input will be. We'll call this, like, say, improve A. Right? We'll take a triangle triangulation as input. We'll say, while there is some edge, uh, call it AB in delta, which can be improved. Flip A, B. And then when you're all done, return delta. OK, that's it. It's kind of a mouthful, this while loop, right? But it's basically you just scan over every edge, right? Check if the angle vector improves when you do this flip. If that's the case, then you just return that edge, and then you flip it, right? And because it's local, this is strictly going to make the angle vector better. It can't possibly make it worse, right? Because remember, if it could make it worse, right? If the smallest of all of these angles was like uh, going to be bigger than the other angles, then we wouldn't have done the flip, right? So that's the uh, the basic argument. So every time we run one iteration of this loop, the angle vector gets bigger, right? So here's the the simple proof, right? It's trivial, uh, trivial observation. Uh, every Iteration increases A of delta. That's the idea. Now, it might take a while, right? Because I just said you had to scan through all of these things, right? So it's maybe not the best way to you know, improve the angle vector. There could be alternatives that are better than this. But this will at least get us towards a more optimal solution. But it's not clear yet that this necessarily gets you to a global optimum. Right? So what we would like to uh, show, hopefully, is that once we have applied enough of these iterations to this uh, triangulation, right? You know, we keep on flipping these edges and then keep on improving the angle vector, that at some point it stops. right? You know, and once it has stopped, we would like that thing that it stops at to be the global angle optimal solution. Right? So that's the, the thing that we would like to show. Um, it's maybe not clear at the first that that would be the case, right? But uh, there are some things that we can say about it, which is that if you did take the angle optimal solution and you fed it into this, it would pop out, right? So if you feed in the angle optimal solution to this algorithm, the result is going to still be the angle optimal solution. It won't change it because there's no edges that it can possibly flip in the angle optimal result. 
So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to need to introduce one additional piece of notation here, which is that we're going to say that if you could take a triangulation here and feed it into this algorithm, right, if it pops out completely unchanged, then we'd say that maybe this is a candidate for the angle optimal solution. right? Or the way that they call it in de Berg is that it's a legal triangulation. Right? So we'll say a triangulation. There's actually a really terrible name for this. Probably a better word would be locally optimal. right? But the notation that they use in the textbook is legal. So we're going to use that uh, is legal. So if improve a of delta equals delta. So that is basically if it's a fixed point of this algorithm, right? If you can take a triangulation and then dump it into this thing and you can't improve it, right? Then it's basically a legal triangulation. Another way of saying it is it's like locally optimal, right? Think of this as locally optimal is probably better language. OK, so time here, good. All right. Um, by the way, let me say one other thing about bistellar flips. These also work in higher dimensions, too, right? So just so that you know, you know this is not a 2D related thing, um, here's how a bistellar flip looks in 3D. I'll just draw this for you very quickly here. Um, again, not necessarily the main focus of today's lecture, but this does generalize. So imagine that we have a pair of uh, tetrahedra like this, which are glued along a common base. Then what you can do is flip it like this. right? So we basically form three new tetrahedra instead of two. All right, so the idea is that you should imagine that this is like one chunk So this would be like the back, this edge. Right, similarly, this would actually be included. So you imagine that you like uh, split basically these faces along the middle here. Right? So we're just going to be taking like these cyclic um, pairs right? and then forming a new tetrahedra. So we have basically like this triangle in the middle. We form one triangle from this vertex and this vertex and this pair, one between this vertex, this vertex, and this pair, and then one between the last pair. So that's the idea. Right? So um, just color them. We'll say that's red. Call this one black. Uh, actually, I guess this one is the black in this picture. And then maybe you have like a blue vertex. Whatever. So hopefully that gives you the idea of what's going on with 3D bistellar flips. But we're not going to worry about the 3D case. I mean, again, because it's just these higher dimensional things, you can do them, but they're not very useful because they're going to be just enormous. OK. So all right, we now have one. So we have this concept of an angle vector, and we have a local method for improving it. Um, so what we would like to now do is look at an alternative way to think about um, this bistellar flip criteria. So basically, it's another way of describing when we will apply a bistellar flip. All right, that's the, the idea here. All right, so we're only going to do a bistellar flip if the angles of these things become larger than the angles of this thing. So the smallest angle here gets bigger than the smallest angle here. So we could just do some sort of trig stuff to figure out what the angles will be. But there is a sort of uh, simpler and more geometric way to do it, right? I mean, if you think about like how, for example, like the Greeks dealt with like angles, they didn't really use trigonometry as such. They would mostly reduce these things to constructions you know, using conics and uh, you know, line segments and so on, right? So let's try to come up with a way to compare this bistellar flip that doesn't involve using any extra trig functions, right? like a simpler way to compare angles. And one way to do this is a classic result 
that probably has been like forgotten in the recesses of your memory unless you've taken a high school geometry class in recent years called Thales' theorem. So this is a pretty useful and I mean it's kind of an intuitive idea, right? You can sort of get the I mean like many of these theorems, you know, in geometry, you just draw a picture and it's like obvious that it has to be true. We're not going to prove it. Um, so it's good that it looks simple. So here's the idea. So suppose we have a pair of points and draw a line between them. Right? And then imagine we have a third point here, we'll call it P. And so we know three points form a circle. Right, so I have to draw a circle here. All right. So let's look at the angle here. Right? We'll call this angle theta. We'll say theta is equal to the angle APB. All right. Now, what Daly's theorem lets us do is it lets us reduce the problem of comparing angles to the problem of testing whether or not points are contained in circles. So we have this point APB, right, in this angle here. Now imagine we have another angle here. Uh, let's call this one R, right? Uh, we'll call that phi. So we'll say phi is equal to the angle ARB. Now it looks pretty intuitive, right, that this angle ARB is going to be smaller than the angle APB. In fact, if we push this out farther and farther away, right, this angle is going to get narrower and narrower. Similarly, if we pick a point inside the triangle here, um, let me just draw this with another color here. Ah, right. Dash line. Um, let's call this one S, right? Uh, we'll call that gamma. A S B. So this angle, if we look here, because it's inside the circle, it appears to be larger, right? Well, it actually is larger. And similarly, if we take a point, uh, call this one Q, right? Then it turns out that this angle AQB is actually equal to angle APB. So here is the, the sort of statement of what this means, right? Is that in this figure here, we have um, angle A uh, S B, right? So that's an angle sign. Draw like that. Is less than uh, angle A P B, which is equal to angle A Q B, which is less than angle. A, uh, no, actually, this should be angle ARB, right? ASB. So here's the idea, right? Is that if we have a, and this is true for all R not in the circle, right? Uh, APB, and for all uh, S properly contained in the interior of the circle APB, and for all Q in the boundary of this disk APB. All right, so here's the, the result, right? Is that basically we can use this theorem to reduce the problem of comparing two angles to the problem of testing whether or not as a, a point is contained in a circle. All right, so that's the, the net result. So for any point R that happens to be outside the circle, the angle formed by ARB is going to be strictly greater than the angle formed by APB, or is going to be strictly less than the angle formed by APB. Right? Similarly, if we pull it inside the circle, then the angle gets larger. So we can imagine that uh, as the angle gets closer to this line, this triangle gets flatter and flatter, the angle gets bigger. Right? And so you can prove this. Uh, I don't think that we're going to have enough time to actually do that today. But um, uh, you can look it up in like a book or Wikipedia or wherever you want. Right? This is a pretty classic result. Right? But it's very useful. 
okay? Because it gives us an alternative way to look at this minimum angle uh, problem here. So how and why? Well, imagine, if you will, that we have a circle here going through these points, right? It'll be a very large circle because this triangle is very fat. So we have this enormous circle. It's going to contain the point C. On the other hand, though, if we look at this triangulation here, right, which is a slightly better triangulation in our angle optimal sense, then we notice that the point A is not contained in this circle here. And similarly, the point B is not contained in this circle. Right? So this is an alternate way to think about bistellar flips, is that if you have an edge like this, right? so we have this edge from A to B, if we look at this triangle over here, if it happens to contain the opposite point, or if this triangle here, the circle formed by them, contains the opposite point, then that edge is no good. And flipping it actually removes that uh, edge from the triangulation. Right? So it'll basically like improve this. Um, it, it will basically remove. Uh, it'll, it will improve the angle vector, right? Because when we move this B out over here, right? Now the resulting angle that we would end up with will be um, larger, right? By this uh, theorem. So basically, this is sort of the uh, geometric version of how you check if you need to flip an edge. You only need to do this flip to improve the angle vector if the opposite vertex is contained in the circle formed by the three vertices of the triangle. All right? So this is what motivates the definition of a Delaunoy triangulation, right? which is what we're talking about today, actually. So I'm going to erase this theorem here. So here is the idea. It's a very simple definition. Uh, and again, we're going to assume all of our points are in general position, so no weird degeneracies or anything. Right? So a Delaunay triangulation. These were invented by some Soviet mathematician like 100 years ago or something. This guy was named like Boris Delaunay. So a Delaunay triangulation. Um, right. We'll say... Um, delta is Delaunoy if and only if um, the circumcircle of any Ti in delta where ti you know, is equal to pi, p, j, p, k. I don't know. Or for any t, I don't even need to put an index on it, right? So take any triangle t in the triangulation delta. Um, so if and only if the circumcircle of this guy contains no other points in p. Right. <clears throat> and this actually is a triangulation, because uh, if two points were contained inside this uh, you know, set, right, then uh, if there was like a line that would cross them, it will have to cross one of these triangles here. Right? That's the, the idea. And by the above argument, we also know that this thing is definitely a legal triangulation in the sense that we described before, right? because uh, they're always going to look like this, right? So we're never going to have a situation where we can do a bistellar flip. And it's unique, right? Because we basically formed this circumcircle for every triangle, right? So this is like a trivial observation. So here are some observations. Delaunay triangulation is unique. Right. Well, it's only unique if their points are in general position, but we're going to assume general position. Right. So if we had, like, say, several, if there are multiple points that were co-circular, then there would be some ambiguity as to how we chop up the points in that circle. Right. But we're not going to worry about that case. Right. So we're assuming that no, uh, no four points are co-circular. Right. That's our non-degeneracy condition. So the Delaunay triangulation is unique. 
uh, and legal in the sense that we described earlier. And moreover, and so this is, you know, theorem, or it's really a corollary of Daly's theorem, right? We basically proved it up there. Every legal triangulation is Delaunoy. Well, that's pretty neat. So what does that mean? Right? Well, it means that if we take any legal triangulation, it's going to turn into a Delaunoy triangulation. But there's only one of those. So that means that every legal triangulation converges to the same triangulation, which is the Delaunoy triangulation of the point set. All right, so this means that the angle optimal solution is actually the Delaunoy triangulation. Right? And the consequence of this is every Delaunoy triangulation is angle optimal. So that's the basic idea behind Delaunoy triangulations, is that uh, there is, in the space of all of these triangulations, this one unique angle optimal triangulation, which happens to be the triangulation that is formed by connecting any three pairs of points which are co-circular and don't have any other point contained inside that circle. Right? So it's this unique triangulation of all triangulations, the, the sort of most angle efficient or angle optimal one that you can form. So, and we have so far seen three ways to think about it. One is that it's you know, angle optimal. The other one is that if you apply this iterative algorithm, it will eventually converge to this solution. And the last one is that it you know, this, has this Delaunoy property. But there is a fourth way that we can think about it, and the one which, in a sense, ties it back to this concept of convex polytopes that we've been spending a lot of time talking about. And that hinges on this sort of circle definition. So I'm going to erase some stuff now. Is everyone OK with this? All right. So here's the idea. Right, so we have this in-circle test. And what we would like to do is give uh, a more efficient or um, algebraic way that we could do this you know, check to see, OK, like if we want to apply a bistellar flip, how do we check that this point C is contained in the circle ABD or vice versa? Right? That's the, the question that we would like to answer. So the trick that we're going to use is one that we have seen before, but we didn't spend much time on, uh, which is this concept of parabolic lifting. All right? So here's the idea. So recall, saw this very briefly when we were first talking about convex hulls in 2D. So here's the idea. So we'll say given uh, x, y in R2, define L of x, y in the following way. So we're going to basically take this pair x, y. We're going to map it to this parabola. Uh, define L, x, y as the projection to z equal x squared plus y squared. Right? So this is a paraboloid. right? And what this just does is, well, we can just plug in x, y there. It lifts it uniquely to a specific z value. So this gives us x, y, x squared plus y squared. Geometrically, we can think of this as we have this parabola. You can imagine that's sort of floating over the plane. And so we have our points down here. And then they just lift up onto the surface of this parabola. Uh, maybe this crosses over that way. OK. So that's kind of neat. We can project them onto a parabola. Uh, we've seen this before. In the case of R2, we use this to show that a convex hull in 2D is equivalent to sorting a set of points in the plane. Right? So if you remember, we started out with this like, list of points, like you know, x0, x1, et cetera, and then we lifted them up into R2. 
And we showed that if we take the convex hull in R2, that was the same thing as sorting that list of points in 1D. Right? Here we're going to use this exact same map, except we're now going to use the two-dimensional version of the same trick. Right? Now, one neat thing, right, uh, and this is the main motivation for this, is that if we imagine taking a plane and intersecting it with this parabola, right, so we'll think of this as like, I don't know, some weird plane here, call it P. Uh, let's think of this thing as basically um, P of x, y, z is going to be equal to, say, uh, A x plus b y plus c z plus d, right? Uh, so this is like basically like this plane here, right? If we intersect this plane with a parabola, what we're going to end up with is some ellipse or circle, right? I mean, generally, it's going to be a circular shape. So if we, we lift the plane, we project it up here, then the projection back of this intersection of this plane will end up forming some circle. All right, that's the idea. OK. Uh, I mean, so why would that be the case, right? Well, let's start with the general equation of a circle. So this is the, the claim. Circle equals intersection of paraboloid. with plane. Well, if we think in 2D, right, you know, just working in coordinates, the equation for a circle looks something like this. So we're going to have x minus x naught quantity squared plus y minus y naught quantity squared uh, minus r squared equals 0, right? I mean, it's just, you know, a circle with radius r centered at the point x naught, y naught, right? Uh, expand this out. What we end up with right, is we have x squared plus y squared uh, by itself here. Right? And then we're going to have minus 2x naught um, x minus 2y naught y uh, plus x squared, x naught squared plus y naught squared minus r squared equals 0. So we're going to group these terms up. Right? So this thing here, this, when we intersect it with the parabola, this is just z. Right? This here, well, we'll just write this as negative 2 x naught x. Right? This, we can just, so leaving this as like the coefficient um, a on ax, this will be negative 2 y naught y, and this will just be the d coefficient. So this is going to be x naught squared plus y naught squared. Uh, plus r squared, or minus r squared, right, equals 0. So in this way, we can see that if we take uh, a circle and then lift it up to this paraboloid, it's actually just a plane when we intersect it with it. Now, if we have three points, right, when we lift them up to this paraboloid, they determine a plane. That plane, when intersected with this paraboloid, is actually the circumcircle of the triangle generated by or spanned by those three points. Right, so in this way, if we take three points like uh, you know uh, A, B, C, right, then this plane here, right, which is basically the uh, join of A, B, C, once we've lifted it, is the circumcircle of A, B, C. So what does this mean? It means that we can use an orientation test, as we have already seen, right, as we already used in the normal case of convex hulls, to check whether or not a point is contained in a circle. Or not. So here is the idea. Um, I'm going to erase a little bit here. But this is the idea. Um, so let's define this test. We're going to call it in circle. And it's going to take uh, four points, right? We're going to call them A. B, C, D. And we'll say that this is going to be equal to, um, let's say, negative 1 if 
D is in the circle spanned by A, B, C. Uh, zero if co-circular. And then plus one if uh, D is not in the circle A, B, C. Right? That's the uh, test we would like to construct. Right? And we want to do this robustly because we're going to have to you know, calculate this thing in code frequently. Um, and so by this argument that I just went through, this is the same thing as checking the relative orientation of the lift of these points. So that this here, you know, this whole mess, is actually equal to the orient, uh, you know, the 3D orientation test of the lift of A and the lift of B and the lift of C and the lift of D. All right, so we're going to lift them all up along this map and compute this orientation test. What does that look like? Uh, I'm running out of space here. Well, really, what it is is it's uh, a determinant. It's basically the sign of the determinant. So we'll say it's the sign of the determinant ax, uh, ay, ax squared plus ay squared, 1 bx, by, bx squared plus by squared, 1 cx, cy, cx squared plus cy squared, 1 dx, dy, dx squared plus dy squared, 1. So if you compute the sign of this thing, right, which is a determinant, and we know we can do this exactly, then you can use that to check whether or not uh, the point D is contained in circle to A and B. And we can also see that this is a symmetric type of thing. So we could you know, imagine flipping one of the rows around, and then it just becomes the opposite of the same test. right? Um, OK. This also tells us a little bit more, though, which is that if we think about what's really going on here, is that we're lifting these points up to this parabola. And the faces of this Delaunay triangulation are just these supporting half spaces, which happen to touch exactly three points on the parabola. That's just a convex hull, right? So here is a fourth way to think about a Delaunay triangulation, which is that it is the convex hull of the lift of all of the points. So it's really just another convex polytope. There's nothing else going on there. It's just a convex hull. That's it, right? You have to lift the points. Compute the 3D convex hull, you now have the Delaunay triangulation. There's nothing else going on. That's it. All right. So let's summarize this. We now have four ways of talking about the same crazy thing. All right. So here is our final theorem for the day. The following are equivalent. equivalent for a triangulation delta. One, delta is angle optimal. Two, delta is legal. Three, delta is Delaunoy. Four, Delta is the convex hull of the lift of P. That's it. All right, the following are all the same. So in a sense, we've basically taken this problem of uh, constructing nice triangulation of, of points and then turned it into convex hulls again. Or you could also think of this as just being a very obfuscated way of talking about convex hulls. So OK. We now have this thing. Uh, what are some fun things that we can do with it? Right? So uh, with the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to go through a couple of applications. And they're very similar to the ones that we saw for spheres last time. Um, all right, so this is all good. Uh, I'm going to just erase this now. OK. So here's the idea. All right. So the first neat thing uh, is that you can actually take a dual of these things, because they're just a polytope right? when we lift them up. 
And so the resulting dual polytope also has a nice geometric interpretation. It's called a Voronoi diagram. All right, so here's what it looks like. Um, so we'll draw some points here. All right. Uh, one thing that I should also point out, too, though, is that when we do lift it up to compute a convex polytope, we have to worry about these boundary edges. So one way to fix that is we'll just stick a point that's very high above the entire triangulation, call that the point at infinity, and then we'll imagine that we draw these extra edges out there. So we'll imagine that there's some extra point here. We'll label it infinity, and that there's these boundary triangles you know, that uh, connect out to it. These, of course, would not be drawn in the triangulation on the plane, but they're there. right? So what does the dual look like? The dual of this polytope is going to replace every vertex with a face and every face with a vertex. And in this case of a parabolic lifting map, there's a very simple geometric interpretation for what's going on here, which is that the vertex for each triangle will be the circumcenter of the cir- or of the, the circle that is the circumcircle of the triangle, right? So this is a thing that you can check, right? But it's basically a consequence of that uh, determinant type theorem, right? So if you imagine if you take one of those planes, you convert it into a point, right, which is the sort of dual of that plane, it will basically be the, circum- the, the center of that circle, right? So the dual of one of these circular plane segments, when unlifted or projected down to the plane, will be a point. And these points will connect along these edges here, forming some kind of hexagonal pattern like this, right? Uh, going off to infinity along these edges, right? So these dual faces here, right? These are regions uh, which are centered around each vertex in the Delaunay triangulation. And they correspond to the neighborhood of all points which are closest to this point here, right? And similarly, these edges are the sort of skeletons in this place. This will look like these will be the points which are equidistant between multiple vertices, or it's sometimes called the medial axis of the point set. So here is the uh, dual interpretation. The dual of a Delaunay triangulation. Uh, the vertices become circumcer- are circumcenters of triangles. Faces regions closest to points, and the edges. Uh, these will basically become this medial axis of the point set. Um, The main motivation for doing this is that once you've constructed this dual structure, uh, the problem of locating the closest point to any given query point, right? So suppose like I, you know, draw a random point, I throw a dart in there, and then I want to know which of this initial set of points I was closest to, This is the problem of locating the cell, which happens to contain the query point that I'm testing. So if I, like, say, you know, throw a dart, you know, and it lands over here, then this point here is closest to this point in our initial point set. And so next time, we're probably going to look at data structures that we can use for accelerating this uh, location problem in a triangulation. But assuming that we can do that location very fast, then we can use that to test Uh, which point is going to be closest to any given point. So it's sort of like a nearest neighbor query. Uh, So this can show up a lot in like user interface applications. So imagine you have like a bunch of elements that are projected onto the screen. You want to figure out which one is closest to say like a user mouse click or um, you know maybe uh, you have some other type of you know uh, GIS type query. Like something comes in, you want to tell me the closest city to like the given you know query point or you know closest street address or something like that. So that's one common application of it. 
Uh, sometimes these Voronoi diagrams, though, are just studied for you know, their own artistic sake. right? So if you look, uh, this pattern, right? each of these cells consists of all of the points which are closest to one of these vertices by themselves. So if you imagine that, say, like each of these like, vertices was some sort of like, nucleation site, and there's like a crystal that's growing out from each of them at a uniform rate, then this resulting growth pattern will turn into something that looks like a Voronoi diagram, which is why a lot of times you see these sort of cellular structures in nature that are just like nested hexagons, right? which are these uh, Voronoi-type structures. So whenever you have like a bunch of like random points, they all start growing at a uniform rate and then smush into each other. The resulting structure that you're going to get will look like a Voronoi diagram. Uh, so that's one sort of artistic or maybe natural place where they show up a lot. Um, OK, only three minutes left. So that's one big application. The other two, there's a couple more things I wanted to talk about, but I don't really have much, point, or much time. Another easy application is finding the closest pair of points in a data set. So once you've built a Delaunay triangulation, you can locate the closest pair of points by just marching over all of the edges. Then you find the closest pair. Uh, it's going to be one of them inside there, so you're done. So that's really easy. Um, OK, here's a slightly more interesting one. Um, if I have a set of points like this, and I want to do a half space range query. So I'm going to just quickly reuse this. I'm almost out of time here, sorry. So suppose we have like a half space like this. We want to test all of the points which happen to be contained in this half space. Well, what we do is two things. First, you run a linear programming query on the boundary, right? which you can store for free. right? I mean, that's easy. And doing this linear programming query is actually just a binary search on the convex hull right? to find the extreme point along the axis of the plane. So you start from some vertex here. Then you can just march along the Delaunay triangulation edges until you've filled in all the points which are contained inside the half space. So the complexity of this uh, half space range query I may run out of time here. We can do this in order of log of the number of vertices plus k, which is the number of returned points. Right? So you can do uh, a range query for a half space for a planar point set in log n time overhead, which is pretty much as fast as it gets. You can't do it any better than that. Uh, that only works in 2D, by the way, right? This doesn't work in like 3D or higher dimensions. Uh, so we should probably write 2D. OK, um, yeah, another good application, Euclidean minimum spanning tree. So imagine you have like a bunch of points in the plane. You want to connect them by, say, roads or wires, and then use the minimal amount of material that spans all of the points in the plane. One easy way to do this is construct the Delaunay triangulation, then just run your favorite minimum spanning tree on that triangulation. That will give you the Euclidean minimum spanning tree in n log n time, which would be much faster than, say, like using all pairs-wise distances, which would be a quadratic time algorithm. So you can do that a little bit faster using the Delaunay triangulation. Uh, OK, I think I'm almost out of time here. Um, I didn't say too much about how to construct these things, but it's not hard, right? So we already saw two algorithms, really, right? One of them was this legal, was basically first build any triangulation, which you can do by sorting the points along x, and then as you're sweeping them, insert them into the convex hull, and then after that's done, run the legalize algorithm on it. The other one was you can lift them up into 3D and then compute the convex hull using your favorite 3D convex hull algorithm. But actually, that first algorithm can be improved quite a bit which is pretty much how all like, nice Delaunay triangulation algorithms work, which is that as you're inserting vertices into the triangulation, what you do is you run the legalized algorithm incrementally. So once you create a triangle, then you only update it locally. Right? So I uh, only have like a minute left, unfortunately. Here's the idea. So imagine I have some triangulation looks something like this. Uh, no, whatever. Suppose I insert this vertex here, and so now these triangles are bad. So I only have to look near the triangles which I just inserted into this Delaunay triangulation. I don't have to look at the regular, the rest of the triangulation. Then I just do the flips locally, right? So it only like flip this thing and then the other triangles. It turns out if you do these flips locally and incrementally, the total number of times that you have to flip is at most order n. So if you just sort the vertices along the x-axis, then insert them using the ordinary bitangent algorithm for finding points on a convex hull, and then 
run the legalized algorithm starting from the triangles which were just inserted, then that will give you the, con or the Delaunay triangulation in n log n. And it's very, very fast and very easy. All you have to do is just run that in circle test to check if you need to flip. So that's Delaunay triangulations in a nutshell. Um, I think the only other comment is that uh, I wanted to get a poll here. Um, the middle of the semester is kind of coming up. Uh, we also have this project coming along here, too. So as a, like a show of hands, how many people would be interested in getting rid of the midterm and then just combining it with the project, right? making everyone's life easier? I don't know if you guys prefer the midterm, because maybe it would be like less work overall, or maybe if you guys prefer the project, because it's like less stressful. Um, either way, right? I mean, we could do that. So uh, if we combine the midterm and project, then the midterm grade would just become part of the project grade, and the project grade would just like expand, you know, and like take up all of that space in the midterm. So there would still be the homework grade, and then there'd just be these two combined things. So uh, just send me an email with what you think about that, and then we'll kind of figure out uh, if we want to get rid of the midterm or if we want to keep it. Uh, otherwise, um, that's it for today. So bye.